Welcome to our Get Data Protection Fit series for 2022. I'm Kate Partridge, a director in our Field Fisher Data team, and I'm co-presenting with my colleague, Michael Butterworth, a fellow director in our London Technology and Data team. Today, we will be presenting on how to draft effective data protection agreements. Thank you for joining us in the third year of our Get Data Protection Fit series. We have a range of sessions planned for this series with a focus on how to document your data protection compliance. The key concept of accountability, which weaves its way throughout the GDPR, is brought to life in this series through a number of sessions covering topics on data processing agreements, which Michael and myself will present on today, legitimate interest assessments, which I think for a lot of organisations have possibly been left untouched. However, the recent WhatsApp decision has again reminded us of the importance of documenting these and the need for transparency of this assessment in your privacy notice, data protection impact assessments, and we have a three-part series on data breaches, specifically assessing, notifying, and documenting these, and Article 30 records, or records of processing activities, and the ongoing task of once you have completed them, how you go about keeping them up to date. I'll now hand you over to Michael, who will go through the learning outcomes we hope you achieve during today's session. By the end of this session, you should be better able to explain what a data processing agreement is, your data and your role in relation to a DPA, your strategic approach to entering into DPAs, and some of the difficulties and pitfalls of DPAs. So firstly, what are data processing agreements or DPAs? So when we refer to DPAs, often we're talking about the documented arrangements between a controller and a processor, but it can cover any number of data relationships, such as processor to subprocessor. Sometimes it can also refer to controller to controller or joint controller relationships, although these are more commonly referred to as data sharing agreements. Today, in this session, we're focusing on the specific terms that are set out in Article 28 of the EU GDPR or UK GDPR, which mandates a number of terms between a controller and their appointed processor. So on this slide, I have some common questions that are often asked in relation to DPAs. So firstly, can I just ignore them? Unfortunately, no. These are mandatory under the GDPR. As between controllers and processors, there must be a contract or other legal act between controllers and processors. This is an obligation on both controllers and processors. So organisations that fail to implement these terms can be subject to fines of up to 10 million euros or 8.7 million pounds, or up to 2% of the total worldwide annual turnover for the preceding financial year, whichever is higher. So the ICO, the UK regulator, and European regulators have issued a number of fines for failure to implement Article 28 terms often in conjunction with other failures, such as insufficient technical and organisational measures or non-compliance with general data processing principles. So do DPAs have to be in a separate agreement? Again, no. It, these can form part of your existing service agreement or they can be in a separate standalone agreement. They can come in the shape of an addendum or an appendix or just as a clause within your agreement. It's fine to have separate commercial terms that sit alongside your DPA, just as long as these don't undermine the data processing terms themselves. So now, can we just have a copy and paste of this Article 28 that's set out in the GDPR in order 
tick the box for the data processing agreements. Again, this is a no. It has been made very clear by the European Data Protection Board. And in my view, this is a position that the ICO, the UK regulator is likely to support. Just a mere copy and paste or a restatement of Article 28 is not going to be appropriate. So your DPA needs to be drafted in light of the specific data processing activity that's occurring. What does that mean? This means the terms need to reflect what is actually happening and what's taking place. So for example, you would need detailed terms or detailed data processing agreement where you've got high risk or complex data. But if you have just low volume data that's low risk, you can probably have a more slimline version with less stringent protections. So notwithstanding the fact that you can't just do a copy and paste of Article 28, the EU GDPR does allow for the European Commission and for supervisory authorities to lay down standard contractual clauses. Um, and the UK GDPR similarly allows the ICO or the Commissioner to adopt standard contractual clauses as well. So the European Commission has actually issued controller to processor standard contractual clauses for European controller to processor transfers. Now these are separate to the um, the standard contractual clauses for international data transfers that have got a lot more publicity <laughs> to date, um, albeit both of these sets were actually released at the same time. So the standard contractual clauses for European controller processor transfers, the aim is to provide a simple way for EU controllers to enter into contracts with processors. What I would say, having read these, is that these terms do largely reflect the GDPR requirements, but in some cases they actually impose broader and tougher restrictions. So they're not always going to be appropriate for the kind of data that your organisation may be dealing with, and they're not particularly favourable for processes. Um, in relation to um, supervisory authority released standard contractual clauses, um, they have been released by some countries, um, including Denmark. And actually in the UK, the ICO has endorsed the use of Danish SCCs. So why can they be so difficult to negotiate or to put in place? Well, this is something we're gonna talk about again towards the end of our presentation. But by way of headline, Often uh, businesses lack an understanding of the actual data that's involved and the risk that this poses to the business. So this might mean that you might spend too much time negotiating them and trying to negotiate points that actually aren't as significant to your organization or perhaps not enough time is set out, you know, correctly explaining the types of data or putting in place appropriate technical or organizational measures. Other elements that can be tricky can be audits, to what extent they're needed, or to the extent you're even able to negotiate them, um, liability clauses and requests for indemnities, the sub-processor chains and the level of control that's really required or needed, the differential bargaining power between the two parties, if you're, particularly if you're engaging with a large vendor that has their own standard terms, and I think at the moment, a real pressure point is also the additional requirements around international data transfers. So on this slide, I've summarized some of the high level points that I've just discussed. Um, one additional point that I've got here at the end is that a controller uh, must always make sure that they only use processes that provide sufficient guarantees to implement appropriate measures. So this sets somewhat differently to the data processing agreement terms themselves and in practice means carrying out some effective due diligence on your prospective vendors and then documenting this to ensure you meet your accountability responsibilities. For example, you might do this by way of due diligence questionnaires to potential vendors. Um, this is something the team has separately covered in a Get Data Protection Fit module on vendor data protection due diligence. 
Further, you might be wanting a very detailed explanation of exactly what is in Article 28 of the GDPR or the UK GDPR. If this is something that you'd like to know more about, we do recommend listening to our earlier Get Data Protection Fit module, and I've contained a link to it in the slide for you here. Now Michael is going to take you through what we consider to be the most important thing to think about when entering into a DPA. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Kate. So, you've got, you've got a DPA to review. What is the most important thing to think about before you start? So, as with any other contract, it's difficult to do anything concrete unless you understand what's the subject matter and what's in scope. Um, it's easy to think that, okay, we've got Article 28, reviewing a DPA it must be easy, surely. In some cases it may be, but actually what's fundamental to it before you pick up and review a DPA is understanding the data and your role. So when looking at the data, what are we going to be asking about? Well, we want to understand what type of data is it? Who is the data, personal data about? Is it about our employees? Is it about customers, other third parties? Um, what volumes is this data in? If it's fairly low volumes, we can be a bit, bit more relaxed when we're reviewing the DPA terms. High volumes of data, then we'll want to look at the, the terms more with a greater level of scrutiny. We might want to have enhanced audit rights, for example. Then have a look, well, what's the criticality to the business? Is this something that we depend upon on a daily basis? Or do we just need it from time to time? Um, is this data fundamental to how we work or is it a, 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 an add-on? You're going to take a very different approach to looking at um, Article 28 and, and DPA provisions if you've got a, um, an HR platform where employees are recording holidays on a day-to-day -day basis and you've got um, other information in there, medical information, all sorts going on compared to, say, a feedback tool that you might just use from time to time. Then what's the value to the business? Is this something that's easily replaceable? Um, is it something that actually you're going to be relying on and um, the, or potentially the data is, you know, it's customer data, um, it's important for generating business or generating revenue. Again, you'll, you'll take a different approach depending on what that is. And the same goes for the sensitivity and, and risk of the data. When you're processing um, names and addresses, contact details, that might be fairly um, less sensitive, lower risk perhaps, compared to say um, special category data, medical data, um, even credit card details, things like this are much more sensitive and higher risks and higher standards that you'd want to apply. And you'd want to flow that approach through into your DPAs. Once you've understood your data, you'll want to understand your role in relation to that data. Are you the controller? Um, this might be clear where you're the organization procuring services and it might be say your own employee data or your customer data that is going to be processed as part of that arrangement. Um, or it, it, it might be, uh, you might be clearly a processor where you're providing those services to uh, one of your customers and actually you've got no reason to use that data except um, to provide those services. In other cases, it might not be as clear cut. Um, you might be a service provider, but actually you're looking to use that data for your own purposes, perhaps to create analytics or um, in to improve your product or, or for overall security of your platform. Then you need to think carefully about whether you're a controller or a processor. Um, whichever you actually are, will determine um, the form of DPA to use. Now, it, it, as, as Kate explained at the start, we're talking today about the controller processor relationship, which has the mandated Article 28 provisions. Um, controller to controller data sharing agreements are equally important to put in place. And that is something that you will need to, to think about um, when you look at DPAs uh, to make sure you're using the right documents to start with.
if you're anything like us or our, many of our clients, then you will be up to your eyeballs in data processing agreements. Getting on top of that uh, mountain of contracts to review can be a, a challenge in itself. And we'd always recommend thinking about uh, putting in place a, a process that means you get that input from the business procurement, your IT teams, who understand the data or, or the processing activities that are going to happen. Um, perhaps you might even put a questionnaire out to um, the, the supplier or the, the counterparty to, to provide that information for you. So that when you're reviewing the contracts, you, you have everything you need in front of you. Um, and that having that sort of strategy in place is critical to making sure that you're managing that data processing risk within your business. Things to think about are who's responsible for getting the DPAs agreed? Um, is it all going to be on legal? Or perhaps it's got to be a procurement responsibility. Who gives the sign off? Will the, will the main service contracts be signed um, before somebody's approved that either a DPA is, has been agreed or is actually not required? Which teams need to be involved? How do you involve them? And then all of that fantastic due diligence that you will have done, how do you make sure the DPA reflects um, that information that you have about the, the service, the processing activities, and that you've documented it so you can show um, you've completed that GDPR accountability and compliance step that's, that's critical. And lastly, and this is something we often see, is uh, often a discussion about whose terms would be used. Um, it's always great to have your own template DPA terms um, that set out that standard of, of what you generally require from your, your contract counterparties. And it, it might be in some cases you, you don't actually use your own terms, but they can be a benchmark to, to use uh, again and assess your uh, counterparty terms that you're reviewing. Um, of course, you can always come to us to make the most of our, our templates and put something in place along with a playbook that, that makes that process as quick and efficient as possible. Thank you, Michael. Uh, now I wanted to move on and look at some of the difficulties and the pitfalls of entering into a DPA. So hopefully um, what you've taken away from Michael's slides and the section of his seminar is that it's really important to put in place your strategic approach when entering into a DPA. So, and this is really important because you don't always get to draft your own DPA. Often you need to negotiate on vendor terms so when you're thinking about your strategic approach, this can feed into this very common scenario. One of the reasons that you end up negotiating on terms that aren't your own or your preferred terms is just because of respective bargaining power. I think it's really important when you are negotiating on vendor terms, however, is to, again, really understand the value of the contract to the business. Is it going to be effective for your team to spend a huge amount of your legal budget negotiating low risk data against a large cloud provider that already has their standard terms? It's really helpful in those scenarios, I think, to have your standard terms or your playbook to really do that analysis against what vendor terms are being put in front of you. So you can see what those initial gaps are, where those gaps are significant and where you have data that is crucial to your organization. That is the time in our view that it is worth spending the legal budget and getting time and negotiating those points. Another difficulty or pitfall is filling in the schedules, believe it or not and completing the technical and the organisational measures because this requires a really good understanding of what data you are processing. Um, it's very common to see these schedules just left blank and no one's really 
turned their mind to them. And what we are finding now is when we are coming back, a lot of organizations, when they are coming back to their agreements that haven't set out some of the basic elements of Article 28, so describing the data, the nature of the processing, you know, really just setting out some of the basic building blocks, describing the background of what's actually happening here. When we're trying to populate or when organizations are trying to now populate annexes for the new EU standard contractual clauses that require a fair amount of detail, organizations can't do that simply. And that is often because the parties just have not given it any consideration or the legal team have not had the time or the input from the business to do this. So this is really an an entire organizational approach. And this is something that's really can be fixed more easy, easy, easier than some of the other elements here that have to be negotiated in. So one of the other common pitfalls, and this is probably not surprising to anyone, is the apportionment of liability and the request for indemnities. Um, if your DPA is contained within a broader services agreement, I think you really should be checking the liability provisions and whether or not they extend to the data um, processing agreement or addendum. Um, you know, I think most of us understand by now that controllers and processors, you, got, you could be exposed to direct claims from data subjects, claims from each other and regulatory action. So one of the practical tips that we always um, recommend is just really making sure we set out the responsibilities of each party very clearly. Again, this is something that's much easier to do when you understand the data and what risk this presents to your business. So in terms of what we're seeing in the market, some organizations want a separate cap for data protection or a super cap. Other ra others wrap it into their overall liability cap or it's a cap based on a percentage of the fees paid over a particular period. Many organizations, at least at the beginning, of GDPR when it first came into force were asking for an unlimited indemnity in, related, in relation to data protection. But I must see, rarely do I see this given in practice. And so it's really one for organizations to think about if that's something that they actually must have if they wanna get a deal over the line quickly. Other areas that have difficulties and pitfalls include audits. So Article 28.3.H requires a processor to make available to the controller all information necessary to demonstrate their compliance and to submit to controller audits and inspections. So again, this is one that depends on the bargaining power of the parties and it can be quite difficult to agree. For example, should the audits take place on-site or off-site? Do, does the vendor even want individuals to be able to come on-site? what facilities can be made available for audits, the frequency, notification requirements, who's gonna pay for it. And I think many processes, particularly with large number of clients, will um, merely require their customers to accept their certification standards or copies of internal third-party audit reports. So again, whether or not an organization or a controller can live with this really requires an understanding of the type of data and what your preferred position is as part of thinking about your overall strategy. Costs, no surprise there. Who's going to pay for what, particularly in relation to when the parties need to cooperate together, audits, which I've just talked about, what kind of assistance is required with subject access requests and DPIAs, should the reasonable costs be accepted by the controller or should this just be the price of what's included as part of the vendor offering? I think once you really understand the data that's being processed here, some of these issues can fall away. If you know, for example, that the data is not of particularly high risk in nature and it's not going to be subject to a DPIA, that's not something that you have to worry about necessarily or spend too much time negotiating on. Um, it's also important to understand the type, I think, of services, and I'm skipping down here to cloud providers, um, because many cloud providers have difficulty or don't strictly adhere to the requirements of the Article 28. For example, the instructions um, is actually what you, the customer, 
do with their services in terms of what you might choose, for example, to upload to the cloud. The cloud providers are going to provide you with their own security standards. So you'd need to get your team on board to make sure they're appropriate rather than just trying to impose your own standards. You know, the way the services are offered um, their sub processes are often already built into the services. So there's not often much of a real or realistic chance of approving or pre-approving or determining who their sub processes might be more that you have visibility of who they these um, processes are uh, and there's many requirements to assist for example or data deletion that are actually fulfilled by self-service requirements and so that can be i think cause a lot of um, entities confusion in the sense that they want to flow down the strict article 28 requirements However, many service providers just do not contract on those terms. And last but not least, I think anyone in this space is probably struggling or at least has a volume of contracts in front of them that need to address the international data transfers um, and the updated EU SCCs in relation to international data transfers or the use of the UK addendum particularly where organizations want to incorporate these by reference, you still need to be very specific about um, populating those annexes. And again, what we're seeing is just a lack of detail or understanding by the business in many cases as to what the underlying contract is actually dealing with in terms of the data. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of difficulties with that. So I think, Combining what Michael and I have presented on, um, how do we draft effective DPAs? It's about being strategic, understanding your baseline position, either because you have some template Article 28 terms or a playbook, understanding the kind of data and its value to your organisation and having a whole organisational approach. And it's not just the legal team that can be responsible for this, but it's a whole organization approach in order to be truly effective in drafting and negotiating their DPAs. As we approach the end of this session, we hope you should be better able to explain what a data processing agreement is, your data and your role in relation to that DPA, and how do you go about finding it out? Um, possibly, your strategic approach to entering into DPA, so at least some thoughts to, to get you along the way, and then some of the pitfalls and difficulties that DPAs might throw up. If you're interested in learning more about data protection and privacy law, then do check out our YouTube channel. It's been going since 2020 and has a variety of content um, to bring you up to speed on some of the basics and also the latest updates in the GDPR world. Join the channel. Subscribe now. For further information, please see the links in the description below. Thank you very much for listening. And that's bye from myself and from Kate.